with the Cube at EMC World 2014 is brought to you by EMC. Redefine. VCE. Innovating the world's first converged infrastructure solution for private cloud computing. Brocade. Say goodbye to the status quo and hello to Brocade. Okay, welcome back everyone, live in Las Vegas for EMC World 2014, this is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Age. I'm joined my co-host, Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. And our next guest is Manavir Das, VP of Engineering at EMC's Advanced Software Division. Welcome back this, again Thank you. this year. It's great to be back so, with you again. This is 2.0 yes. for the CUBE interview from last year's Viper 1.0, uh, I guess you yes. can call it 1.0, but yes. um, a lot of conversation last year on Viper. First of all, last year I was super impressed by the slides. Right. The slides were very right. impressive. Right. Um, the slideware was great. I mean, the diagrams, how you guys thought about the architecture right. was really well thought through. Right. And a little bit different than what I might have expected. Right. So give us the 2.0 version one year later. You're out right. in market, you're out right. pushing the envelope now. Right. Give us the quick update yes. of all the quick highlights. Yes, and I think I would, I would second what you said. The story was great and the story was all in slides. And what's changed in the last year is number one, we're in production with a number of customers. And two, we have really built out the platform uh, to the level that we were intending to from the beginning. And we just had a stage delivery model. So if you recall last year when we came out, we said Viper's a storage system that can run on top of your existing storage devices like your arrays. Uh, what we've done now with Viper 2.0, it's a full-fledged storage system of its own, which means that it runs directly on the metal it runs on commodity hardware, it does all the data protection, all of the IOPS itself, and it provides a variety of different protocols like object, HDFS, et cetera. But it's also modern in the sense that it's, it's completely in software. And so from a customer viewpoint, you can take it as a piece of software and apply it on your own servers and scale it out as you go, um, and that gives you a flexible model. At the same time, we also announced the ECS appliance, which is really, it's exactly the Viper stack, but it's pre-bundled by EMC with commodity hardware because we think we're pretty good at sourcing you know, uh, effectively priced commodity hardware and then we put it in a bundle that we provide. Um, Jeremy Burton says, don't fight fashion. Yeah. Fashion is elastic right yes. now. Yes. The word elastic. Yes. Uh, being yeah. elastic is actually good too. If you yes. can, you know, be elastic. So elastic, it's, it's a box, it's not a service, it's not in the cloud, it's not a cloud service, it is a box. But it's an elastic, elastic box because... Why elastic? Uh, because the way Viper really works is, you give it as many servers as you've got, it will lay itself out over all those servers, and that's as much capacity as you get. The more servers you add, the more capacity you get. It so happens that with ECS, what we've said is, we'll put some servers in a box and give them to you, but that's just a unit. And so you can have as many of those boxes as you want, and you're going to get more and more capacity. The other thing also that that was not, uh, you know, we didn't go into that detail in David Goulden's keynote, within each of those so-called ECS boxes, there's a number of servers. And if you open the door, you can keep putting servers in. So you can put one server at a time, two servers at a time, as many as you want. It's completely, uh, completely elastic. Right. So think, thinking about ECS, it seemed to me that so you're drawing a comparison from a TCO standpoint with yes. the public cloud. Yes. It would, it would seem to, what struck me is that there, a lot of your service provider customers would like to take that box. Yes. Is that really where uh, uh, the, the target is or is it as much sort of on-premise big shops wanting to duplicate the capabilities it's, of the cloud? It is very much service providers, but there are two kinds of service providers. There's the one kind that we traditionally think of, which is I want to compete with the public cloud so I want public cloud in a box so that I can offer it as a service. But there's also internal IT being a service provider, right? You look at a lot of the big enterprise IT shops, they're serving hundreds of internal customers building applications. And what they're seeing is the internal customers are moving to the public cloud because it's more convenient and it's cost effective. And the internal IT customers we talk to, they're struggling with that because they're the ones saying, no, no, you cannot go to the public cloud because of you know, regulation, compliance, and all of that, but they don't have a weapon in their own arsenal to offer right, to their internal customers. So for them, the ECS is a great model because they rack and stack these, and then they're effectively offering a private cloud version 
of that public cloud just for their own set of internal customers. And right? you've incorporated things like chargeback in there. And, yes, and it's like. all built in. Do you expect a lot of customers will take advantage of that? Or? I absolutely think so, and that's definitely evident from our customer conversations because you think about internal IT, you know, you got the finance department, you got the, the HR department, everybody's consuming, and they have to be built in some fashion. So that's a chargeback model, and of course for Traditional service providers, uh, you know, exposing it out, they clearly need chargeback because they've got third parties who are creating accounts, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely see that, yes. So one of the things that all the CIOs I talk to pretty much look at Amazon's web service and say, we want some of that. They all get a little nervous because there's be a lot of issues involved yes. around being fully enterprise grade, and they're working on that, they're trying. Yes. You guys are kind of coming with the hybrid cloud, but they all kind of say, I want OpenStack. And I always ask, David and I always talk about this, I always ask the CS, why do you want OpenStack? Yes. I want to look under the hood, I want to be able to play with it, I, don't want, I want some comfort. So in a way, it's a hope, it's a dream, it's a, yes. it's a bridge yes. uh, to the next platform. Yes. OpenStack is one of those I call maybe a small bridge, yes. compared to the bridge that you guys are promoting. So yes. what is the OpenStack support? You guys, I saw some buzz about Cinder. Yes. Is that official? Yes. What role do you guys play in OpenStack? Yes, so that's a great question. So I think, Number one, we do see that growing movement and Viper philosophically from the beginning has been about choice. So what we've done with OpenStack is two levels. Number one, everything in Viper is exposed through REST API, okay? And so in that way, it is integrated into the full orchestration system of OpenStack. And actually, we've done that work as, uh, ourselves, it's available, you can take Viper and plug it into the rest of your OpenStack environment. Uh, so Viper becomes your storage plane. The other thing we've done is at the bottom, so you know, when we came out with Viper, there was the question about, there's a plethora of different storage devices and data centers, and how do you uh, build support for all of them? And so we kind of had this, this sort of plug-in model at the bottom, and what we've done with OpenStack is we've said, okay, there's an evolving standard like Cinder, which a lot of people are using, mm -hmm. so what if we built in natively support for the Cinder model at the bottom of Viper? And so what this now means is, you take any storage device, if you've got a Cinder plugin built for that thing, then Viper will automatically be able to talk to that device and integrate it into the storage pool, right? So, so that's the kind of integration. Uh, another example at the top is OpenStack has an object protocol called Swift, right? So Viper object natively speaks Swift. So if you've got any application that is working with OpenStack Swift, it is also going to work with the Viper object Right off the bat, right without any modification. So, what kind of what kind? You run an engineering organization. Yes. You got yes. developers working yes. for you, all software guys. Yes. What kind of resources can you commit? Are you wanting wanting to commit? Are you able to commit to OpenStack? So, I think uh, for us, it's an important direction, right? So, from that point of view, we don't have a problem committing resources to it. I think uh, the 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 interesting issue with with OpenStack is that we have to have a way of participating in that ecosystem. And it's certainly something that we are, we are eager to do, and we are just uh, trying to work through uh, sort of the mechanics of how that gets done. But we certainly build Viper with the view that we're interested in contributing. So, are you negotiating? Is that, is that what's going on now? Or are you sort of, I mean, not that uh, you're negotiating, but you know yeah. what I mean. Are you trying to, sort of, when I say negotiate, sort of right. find the right path, figure out where to add value, right. understand where you're going to be able to have the biggest impact? So I impact. have an easy answer to that question, which is, I'm the engineer, so I don't get paid <laughs> enough to solve those problems. So what I'm making sure of is that we build the product in such a way, we yeah. write the code in such a way that, can, that it's friendly to that, mm -hmm. and then, you know, the others decide what to actually do. Okay, but so. you're you're applying your engineering resources to that point, yes. not, not necessarily saying, okay, go off and write OpenStack correct, you know, correct. modules. We're building our code with a view to the fact that, like every developer I hire on my team, the first thing we tell them is, you have to have pride of ownership. The code you write is like the painting you produce, right? And so that means, when other people look at it, you want, to, you want them to feel impressed by what you've done. You got to have pride of ownership. So, you know, we write all our code that way, right? With the view that anybody could be able to see it and feel like, wow, these guys really know what they're doing. How do you evaluate good code? What's, what are the metrics you use? Uh, simplicity. I think the only things that truly work at scale are simple things. So when I interview an engineer and he describes to me a really complex algorithm that he put together to squeeze the last 1% out of something, you know, I'm not impressed. You send them to the competitor. Yes, <laughs> and when they talk to me about how they boil something down, to its essence and implemented something very simple, I get impressed. And actually, 
Uh, one of the things I'd love to talk to you about is our geo replication algorithm, which is an example of that, Super, right? Yeah. And, and uh, so, great. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about it. So, so I think uh, you know that's one of the things I'm particularly proud of with Viper because uh, we think it's truly unique in the industry. If you think about you know how you protect your data across data centers. Right, so you want to protect yourself from, there's a meteor or whatever, you lose an entire data center and you got to have your data elsewhere, how do you do that? So there's a fundamental trade-off, okay? So on the one side, what you do is you say, I take my data and I locally protect it. I do some amount of RAID or erasure coding or something within my data center and then I take this whole enchilada and I copy it a bunch of times into other data centers, okay? Now, if I do that and I make full copies of my data in different parts of the globe, the advantage is that if I lose a full data center, I've got a whole copy of it elsewhere. Yep. And furthermore, even within a data center, if I lose one disk or two disks or one server, because I did local protection with erasure coding, I can reconstruct the data without having to go to very other quick, places. Very fast, right? yeah. It's very fast, but it's high overhead mm -hmm. because I've got all Expensive. these copies, right? The, the flip side of that, is what is called geo erasure coding, where you take that same local erasure code, but instead of spreading it across servers in one site, you spread it across servers across many sites, okay? Now here, uh, the advantage you've got is that the overhead is much lower, because instead of full copies everywhere, you took your original data and you sort of spread it across, okay? But the downside of this approach is, now imagine I lost some disk drives in one data center. In order to reconstruct the data, I have to fetch the rest of it from every other data center, now I've got WAN traffic, mm -hmm. right? So it's a fundamental trade-off, and I think the state of the cheap art in the- Cheap but slow. Cheap but slow, yeah. right? And so the fundamental trade-off mm -hmm. the industry is at with the state of the art is I got to pick one or the other. And every storage system you see out there, all these storage startups, et cetera, they, they have a long menu of geo capabilities, and it's all or. Either you go with this, and it's good here and bad there, or you go with that, and it's bad here and good there. And the algorithm we've invented for Viper is actually the best of both worlds. So we have a model where we spread the data in such a way that we've actually got full copies of the data, so you don't have to go across the van, and yet in terms of overhead, it's as low overhead as anything you would do by distributing your erasure code. And so that's unique and state of the art, but what I'm especially proud of, uh, David, is in terms of simplicity, if I were to actually take an engineer and describe the technique on the whiteboard, as I'll be doing in my in my sessions at EMC World, they would look at me and say, there's nothing intelligent here. Duh, why didn't I think of that? So, <laughs> and that's my whole point. <laughs> Those right. things work well at scale. So this is math. It's this new, is math. New math, this is yes, or new math. organic built in your, in yes. your group, not yes. something that you borrowed exactly. somewhere or bought and it's, in somewhere. You know, we've patented the heck out of it and all that kind of stuff, of course, but yes. Okay. So how hard is it to pull that off? I mean, explain to the folks, I mean, you said you're most proud of it. Yes. What's, what's so hard about that? that's full of geo, the geo distributed with multi-site with protection. Right, because um, if you think about it, right, um, when, whenever you build a system where you're balancing two extremes, right, the thing that you only get by having done this before is what is the right balance point, right? I would, think, I would say most things in technology as in life are like an 80-20 game. You're never going to get 100% of both things that you need, right? So you build a sort of a curve where on this end, I get 100% of this and 0% of that, and the other side is flip, and I want to find that point in the middle that says, okay, I'll get 80% of both, and that's a great solution. And so the, the art, if you will, here in this computer science is, how do I find that right place on the dial to get 80% of the effect of each, and that's sort of the the difficult thing. Thanks so much for coming on the cube. I sure, really appreciate, appreciate it. great technology. Again, last year, we, you know, we kind of joke and we love to call it slide. We're very impressed with the architecture. You guys put in some meat on the bone, some great science behind it, computer science, some data science, some engineering. Obviously, with services, it's fantastic. I'll let you get the final word in. Explain to the folks um, out there this year within your group why why is this trend right now so important? What is the main thing that's happening in the marketplace that's enabling you guys? to, to uh, capture this opportunity? I think people are realizing that it's not just enough to have data, but data is of no use if I can't actually do things with it, if I can't do things like analytics on it. And so in order to take advantage of that trend and to prepare people for it, we've built a storage system that says all your data is sitting in one place. It's a very high scale system to ingest data, but it's also a very high scale 
data warehousing system on which you can do analytics so you can extract the most value out of that data. And I think that's really the trend that we're after. So you think customers want real-time actionable insights? I think they want insights into the data. And they need a system that can give them that, yes. Jennifer, thank you very much, sure. VP of Engineering. Uh, tough job, I'm sure you got a lot of pressure on you. Yes. Doing a great job, thanks for coming inside theCUBE. As always, a fantastic conversation. Viper 2.0 and more, uh, software-driven, software-eating the enterprise. This is theCUBE. We're doing our best to broadcast that software and that data to you. We'll be right back after this short break.